Mrs. Gracie Mathai, CEO of Baby Memorial Hospitals, Calicut, Kerala. Graduate in Nursing, MHA from TISS, Mumbai, MHRDM, Mumbai University. Postgraduate Diploma in Medical Law and Ethics from NLSIU, Bangalore. Past experience as Group Quality Consultant, Head of Administration and Quality, Chief Operating Officer, General Manager, Hospital Administrator at Aster DM Healthcare Hospitals in India, and Nursing Director at Lilavati Hospital, Mumbai and Aster Mims, Calcutta. Accreditation Coordinator, Survey Coordinator for NABH or GCI, Certified Green Belt in Six Sigma and also the Lead Auditor. Involved with NABH as Principal Assessor, Faculty Assessors Course and POI. Assessed more than 150 hospitals and served as member in Technical Committee and Accreditation Committee, NABH, two terms each, Vice President, TMA. And presently, the Co-Chair Accreditation Committee, NABH and Chair of Kaho, Kerala State. Warm welcome to Mrs. Gracie Mathai. Over to you, ma'am. for that great introduction a warm good afternoon to all of you and first of all let me thank the organizers of this hospital for inviting me over here and giving me little time to speak to each one of you i don't know what all she said is correct that only you can judge at the later period but yes of course when it comes to nabh or accreditation or jca I have humble experience uh, so that itself will speak. Now you have heard from morning about patient safety and especially when you were hearing Dr. Sugandhi, it was all the mishaps what has happened at different hospitals in the country. So that itself was sufficient to understand what is patient safety, yes or no? All those cases what she has presented itself will give you a hundred percent clue that what is patient safety it means what you should do in order to save the patient and if you have not given a safe administration or safe position or if you are not consider the safety of the patient what is going to happen that's what we have seen now even dr lallu i have heard only little part of lallu dr lallu also said about now may not be the patient safety aspect what she said the patient's responsibility in maintaining their own safety. It is not only really the organization responsibility. Now what has happened when I spoke to this organization, the Swati, what she want me to take on patient safety in relation to NABA standard as well as in relation to JCA standard. See, when you go to NABA standard as well as JCA standard, if you go to every chapter, the 10 chapter of NABH and the 12 chapter of 12, 13 chapters of NAB, uh, JCA, if you go through, you can see that safety is spoken at every level. So if you want me to take the safety from these both standards, it will take one week program. It's a one week program. So whatever I am going to talk to you is a gist of patient safety, which I have directly taken from both these standards, NABH standard as well as from the JCA standard, nothing from my experience or nothing from my hospital it is purely on the hospital standard what we'll be talking now certain thing i don't know how many of you are from you are not from accredited hospitals how many of you are not from accredited hospital no nobody everybody is from accredited hospital yes or no either nabh or jca or nabh as well as jca so you know the basic of the patient safety because Whatever standard what we learn, whatever standard what we see, all is related to patient safety. In other words, what I always say that the other meaning of quality service is also patient safety. When I say that I am providing quality service, it ultimately what is the patient safety. So let us look into 
The mnemonic, if we take the safety mnemonic, how does it is? S stands for sense the error. So wherever there is an error, you should sense yourself. There is an error. When you pass through the veranda, when you hear somebody is talking, when you are standing in the lift, when your doctors talk themselves, when your patient relatives talk themselves, you have to sense the error. Then, after sensing, you cannot keep quiet. You have to act to prevent it. If they are talking about something, or if you have seen something with any of your six senses, if you have seen, or if you have heard, or if you have smell, you have to see that. You take every action to prevent it. Then you have to follow the safety guidelines. E stands for inquire into accidents and death. Whenever there is an accident, a small accident in the hospital, fall of patient from the bed. Now, Sugandhi has said that one of the patients had fallen in the labor room and what happened to the patient. So nobody knows that nurse would have hided that or that doctor hided that. When the patient has been taken to the operation theater, no one in the operation theater is knowing that what has happened to the patient. And suddenly when the patient gone into cardiac arrest and later when post-mortem the patient has been taken and the body have been taken, then they came to know that. So you have to, whenever there is an accident, it may be small or big, it may be a near miss, nothing happened. Patient is okay or you are okay. But still you have to go into inquiring what has happened, what went wrong, where it went wrong. If a death also occur like that, what went wrong, where it went wrong. And take appropriate remedial measures and everything is your responsibility. You cannot put this on someone else. Usually we have the habit, especially human beings have the habit of telling, no, it's not because of me, it's my staff. It's not because of me, it's my boss. It's not because of me, my husband. It's not because of me, my children. I have all these people around. My housekeeping staff is not good. I get all low-grade uh, um, substances or equipments or uh, consumables in my ward. That's why all this happened. No. It's all your responsibility. Whatever happened, it is your responsibility. It is no one else's responsibility. What you get with that, you have to do the best to your patient. So that's a mnemonic of safety what we see. And now, why safety? Especially we talk about in the hospital. Safety can be anywhere. But why hospital is important when it, the point of safety when it comes, why hospital is important? Because it's a people intensive place. People intensive. Anywhere you go to the hospital, outside the operation theater, outside the ICU, in the OP reception area, outside each of your investigation area, what you can see? People. There will be different types of people. Moreover, you can see some other visitors may be coming, that visitor may be some patient visited, maybe some of your visitors, some other external agency may be coming. So the hospital is an area of people intense. And of course, apart from that, you have your patient also in your wards or in your ICU, in your OT or in your other area. So because it's a people intense area, unsafe things can happen. If there is no one, unsafe things may not happen because it's a high patient. Now provide service to sick people around the clock for 24 hours. Hospital is a place which is providing service to the sick people. It is not like a picnic spot. It's not like a pleasure trip. It's not like a hotel where you stay. It's something different because it's all sick people are there. And that also different types of sickness. And this sickness is not only for the morning time or afternoon in the evening. The sickness throughout the 24 hours, the sick people are over there. People have free access to enter any part of your hospital any time for advice and treatment because no part of your hospital is closed. Maybe at the night time, if we have four or five doors or openings or gates, what we can say, maybe we may close almost all the doors and one gate may be closed, open. But that gate is open. For what? Any time your patient can enter your organization because that gate is open. So you cannot stop anybody. And you don't know who is entering your organization. It may be your enemy, it may be your friend, it may be people who want to take revenge on you. All those type of people may enter. So you don't know who is entering. Or if one of your patient is admitted and there some enemies are coming in order to hurt that particular patient, those type of people also enter. So anyone can be over there. Another thing, the atmosphere of the hospital is filled with emotion different types of emotion. Emotion means pain, the emotion of sadness, emotion of happiness, 
all type of emotions will be there. When somebody is delivering a baby, there will be a happy emotion. They are ready to receive a new person into their family. When somebody is dying, it's a sad emotion. It's not an expected emotion. So different, somebody is sick or somebody is being diagnosed into a disease which the cure is not possible. So that type of different types of emotions are there. So you may have to consider all those things also. What has happened? If you and me also, if I am in a sad mood or one of my relatives have death or maybe dying and then someone else is enjoying happiness next to me, I will not tolerate it. I think I am in sad mood and the people on the next door is enjoying. So what will happen? There can be a two crash between these two emotional people itself. So we enjoy because we have a happy occasion and you are sad because you have a sad occasion but each one cannot think of others and behave because I have to enjoy, if you have a sad also, I have to enjoy my happy occasion. So there can be some crash or something can occur or unsafe things can happen over there. Since hospital operate under continuous strain, it gives rise to irritation, confrontation, conflict and aggression. All of you will agree with me how much of a good you give, the, your patient is not satisfied. Or sometimes your patient may be satisfied, your relatives may not be satisfied. Sometimes your patient and relatives are satisfied, but your doctor is not satisfied, your boss is not satisfied. So those particular type of confrontation occur. So again, what can happen? Unsafe situation can occur in the hospital. That's why hospital safety is of utmost importance. Now patient safety, what is patient safety? Is the absence of preventable harm. Absence of preventable harm, simple thing. Now you, all of you know that when you work in the organization, a hospital, all of you know that you are exposed to various type of risk. If you got a needlestick injury, you cannot sue the hospital. Why? Because knowing that when you work in the organization, you get needlestick injury, you have joined that organization. It is unwritten consent between the healthcare organization as well as the staff. Whereas, if this needlestick injury occur to a patient or a relative, they can drag us to the court but a staff cannot drag us to the... So, preventable harm is also there and there are certain harm which can occur. Now, when you work in an organization and especially when you work in the TB ward, there are always chances of you getting TB. Now, all of you remember the time of COVID. What was there? COVID patients were there. Many of our staff got COVID and you cannot avoid that. And you as a healthcare worker, whatever position of yours, you can't say no because this infection is there, I cannot work in this hospital. You have, you know that infection is there, you know this will be spreading like this way, you know you will get this infection one day, still you have to work over there and you cannot pull the hospital to any court of law. Why? Because knowingly you have given an agreement, an unwritten agreement between you as well as the organization. So there are many things which can be preventable and non-preventable. And the discipline of patient safety is a coordinated effort to prevent harm by everyone. It's not only by one person, it's by everyone. Now, till now, we were talking about it is the healthcare worker's responsibility. Now, this year onwards, even in India, we started talking about it is not only the healthcare worker's responsibility, it is the patient and relative responsibility. WHO, the Patient Safety Day, is on 17th of September every year, and it started from 2019 onwards. And this year, the theme is not medication safety or environment safety. This year, theme is engaging patient for patient safety or patient is responsible for their safety along with the we employees or we hospitals are responsible. The patient is also responsible. So that way, that is what one important thing. So it's a coordinated effort. It's not only an effort by the employees or by the staff, but it's also an effort by the patient. And Ultimately, whenever we say something, whether it is in the standard point of view or any other point of view, only one thing each one of us who all are in the quality especially, we have to remember and we have to think this, do no harm to the patient. You may not be able to do any good thing to the patient, okay, don't do any good things. But you don't do any harm to the patient. That is, should be your slogan, whether morning, evening, night, whether you are a doctor or a nurse or a technical staff or a friend of staff, your slogan has to be, I will not do any harm to the, my patient. Now, there are various principles of patient safety. When you think about, there are different principles of patient safety. Proper identification of patient and matching to their care element. We have already seen different identification. You have to identify the patient for what? One simple example, in your hospital, you don't have a 
neurology department. I'm just giving an example. Or you don't have a cardiology department. But you have all other department. You have received a patient for gastroenterology problem. And that patient already have a neurological problem, maybe a, uh, maybe a epilepsy or some other old CVA or some neurological problem. Because the patient now have come to you for a gastro problem and you have a gastro physician as well as a gastro surgeon, though the patient is having other problems, you have admitted the patient, no, you cannot. If you do not have the facility to treat the patient, not only for his gastro, even for his cardiac, as well as even for, the, for his neurology problem, you cannot admit the patient. You understood? No. So that is, what is there in your hospital? Or, okay, I will treat for gastro, then let the patient go for his cardiacs into some another hospital, then let the patient go for his neuro problem to another hospital. No. Your patient has not come to you for that. He want his cardiac problem, his neuro problem, as well as his main problem of now, that is of gastro problem. All three things will be resolved within this hospital admission in your place. You got my point? So that is the standard place. So that's the first principle. Proper identification of the patient and matching to their care elements, what they require and whether those elements are there with you. In some of the cases, you have an OP facility, but you don't have an IP facility. No, you cannot admit it. You cannot admit the patient because you don't have an IP facility. You cannot see. Now, second is prevention of patient handover error and safety during transportation. This is another principle. Many times what happens, how safety comes into danger, how safety is play, because the proper handover is being not given. I can give you n number of examples of improper handover, but because of the time shortage, I'm limiting to that. So if you are not given the patient properly, you means it was not only the nurses, even it is the doctors also. When you the shift is over, you have to hand over the patient. What you have done, what you wanted to do in the next shift, what all investigation you have done, and what results you are waiting, and when it comes, what you have to do the further. All proper handover have to be done. Then another is assessing medical accuracy while giving care to the patient. Accuracy of medicines or medications or the medical devices, what you are using, that also have to be accurate. Now, performance of correct procedure at the correct body site, that of course in IPSG, Dr. Joseph will be taking into detail, and take appropriate precautionary measures to avoid infection. So these are the principles of patient safety. Now we will go into detail whose safety, people, place, property, and safety of place means infrastructure, electrical, mechanical, fire, all those things. Property means your store, your asset, your equipment, all this safety will come. And again, people, when you think about it, the staff, visitor, patient, everybody, it's not only for one person. I skipped it because I don't want to go into detail. Now, this is the slide which I wanted to go into little detail. When you think about patient safety, it has many components. It has many aspects. So, environmental safety, your medication safety, your surgical safety, your anesthesia safety, your radiation safety, your laboratory safety, your sanitation, infection control, biomedical waste management, disposal related safety, your blood safety, your electrical safety, and your equipment installation safety. These are few aspects of safety which we have mentioned over here. So patient safety, when you think it is not one small thing, it's a big thing, it's a huge thing. Though I have mentioned few things over here, there are many more things when you go into detail. We'll be talking into detail on each of the safety based on our standard. So when we talk about patient safety, I have done everything. Only one safety I have not looked into means there is an unsafe practice. So all aspect of safety you may have to look into when you think about the patient safety. Everything, it is not only medication safety, or it is not only the safety where the safety was not considered by a doctor or a nurse, no. The safety, a friend of his staff is not considered. That's also an unsafe practice. The safety, an engineering department person installed something wrong, and that is also a patient's unsafe practice for the patient. And there is a loose wire somewhere, and that's also an unsafe practice in the organization. There are chances of fire or any other thing. So when you think about safety, my standard tells that all these aspects of safety have to be looked into by each one of you. Let us look into one by one. First of all, the JCA standard very clearly says, when you think about safety, there are six areas you have to prepare a detailed document. 
it's not only you have to do certain things first you have to prepare a detailed document what are that safety and security your document related safety and security the degree to which the organization building construction area grounds and equipments do not pose a hazard or risk to patient staff or visitor security protection from loss destruction tampering or unauthorized access of use now second hazardous material handling storage and use of radioactive and other materials are controlled and hazardous waste is safely disposed all will come into detail later but this is again that six point what you have to mention you have to prepare it's a document what you have to prepare that's what i said the third thing is emergency management there are n number of emergency management or your co codes and how you are going to manage your code blue your code pink your code orange your code red your code anything how you are going to manage that again comes into safety fire safety coming into medical equipment safety and the utility system your electricity your water other utility system how you are going to maintain so all these six safety aspect you have to prepare plan for the safety aspect that's what nabh nabh do not say that you have to prepare all this it can be a combined one also all this can be put it in your safety manual also will do but if you are going or you are planning to go for jc no the six plans have to be separate you cannot show these things in your safety manual and then you say that i have done that so six different plan let us go into detail the, into one by one now safety and security hospital has a program to provide a safety physical facility your entire physical facility have to be safe your building your roof your air everything have to be safe now hospital has documented current accurate inspection of its facility you build the hospital everything is okay your air is proper your electrical things are okay your roof is okay your walls are okay but when you have built that time it was okay what is the position of these things today have you taken a facility round of your organization when you have taken the facility round of your organization nabh up to fourth edition facility rounds used to be taken once in six months in the clinical area and once in a year in the non clinical area but now the fifth edition wants how many how many times physical uh, facility rounds need to be taken surprise huh? monthly so say loudly monthly you have to take so you cannot take six monthly and yearly and satisfy yourself you have to take monthly so what was your last monthly facility round now facility rounds means doesn't matter like i have two big building tall building and one building got 10 floor and one building got eight floor i will take one floor or two floor is that enough no entire hospital entire hospital of my 10th floor of my one block and the eighth floor of my other block and my other utility area whichever is around and surrounding area of that along with your stp your other things everything have to be taken round means everything no area is being left when nabh assessor come they go into one or two area for them it's okay they go to one or two area when you when you do one physical facility round you have to go to every area and the report of each area have to be there now some assessor may be like me now what is i am not going i don't know what dr joseph do if you have okay october the uh, august month you have gone i have so seen your area where you have gone when i was checking your july i found two three area you skipped when i was checking your june round i found again two three area you you were missed i'll 100% ask you questions why you missed because comprehensive facility round across the hospital no area should be left left what behind unattended so every area i have to wait now based on the inspection hospital develop a comprehensive proactive risk assessment to identify area in with the potential injury so because you do the uh, facility round you get to know various risk are there that risk can be physical risk that can be chemical risk that can be financial risk you count it of any way it can be of any type of risk unless until you go you will not find that risk is there so when you go you will find that these risks are there and when you know that this risk is there what you will do you will try your measures to prevent those risk from leading from risk to a disaster if that risk is left behind and you have not done anything what can happen 
this risk will lead to a disaster. So preventing the disaster, you will attend to that particular risk. Hospital has a program to provide secure environment, including monitoring and securing area identified as security risk. You have various area in your organization as secure and security risk is there. Your dead area, some corner, you don't know who will be there and what is happening in that corner. So that area you have to think about. Now, how you are providing access to different people to this area? Everybody can have access to everywhere? Or only few people can have access to some area? Or some people cannot have access to some area? So that you may have to prepare. The program ensures that all staff, contract workers, and vendors are identified. You know, it's very difficult, especially in my hospital, when I think about, because from old days onwards, it has a habit of inviting and welcoming everything. I'm talking about my hospital. I'm not talking about Al Shifa, OK? Inviting everyone, oh, you have come, come. You, you are from there, come. You are there from come. What has happened? Everybody is coming. And there are a number of openings. I have five, six openings are there. So through all those six opening, people will come. Do you think that I can put security to each opening on each shift? It's not possible. So anyone can come from anywhere. How you know who are they? They may be your friend in front when they talk to you. But what is in their mind, you don't know. In this era, where parents have been killed, children have been killed, spouse have been killed. Yes or no? I'm not joking. This is what is happening. There is no value for husband, there is no value for wife, there is no value for children, there is no value for parent. In this era, how can you believe that this fellow is my friend and he will not do any harm? They can do any harm at any time. So see that each person who enter your, and this is JCA requirement. NABS requirement is also there, but they are not looking into that in depth. What identification you have given your vendor? How can you identify that this person is a vendor? How can you identify that this person is a visitor? How can you identify that this person is a staff, full-time staff? How can you identify this person is a part-time staff? Each person have to be, each person who enter your organization have to be identified, even the visitor or worker. Now, when planning for demolition or construction or renovation, the organization conduct a pre-construction risk assessment, PCRA pre-construction risk assessment, which include what is the air quality, what's the infection control, what's the utilities, noise, vibration, hazardous materials which is generated from that area, and any emergency services, example, code or anything, if you, you may have to call on that particular construction area, how you are going to handle. Or through that construction area, some other code is called into the neighboring area, you may have to pass through that area, so how safe you are when you are going. So this you have to do. This is again standard requirement. Again, your environment should have adequate light, adequate ventilation, exhaust fan, stair with handrail, slip preventing floor, prevent the noise pollution, safe wheelchairs and trolleys, no water logging in the bathroom, call bell system for patient, all these things have to be there. So this is what first we have completed with our environmental safety. Now, second is the hazardous safety. This picture I have shown you just to tell you that all your hazardous material how to be kept properly with proper labeling. That's very important. You may keep it properly, but it has to be properly labeled and you have to keep. So hazardous material, you have to have a program in your hazardous material and that program should address inventory, how much hazardous material you have. Storage, where all you kept this hazard. Okay, we'll take hypochlorite solution. Okay, one hazardous material, which is usually with us, is the hypochlorite solution. All together, how much hypochlorite solution you have in your hospital? How much mean? How much is there in your central store? How much is in your other store? How much in your medical ward? How much in your surgical ward? How much in your ICU? How much in your neonatal ICU? You are getting my JCA wants everything like this. And ABS just want a common thing like, okay? So inventory, how much, and where it is being stored. Handling, how you are going to handle. And the use of hazardous material and the waste, how you are using. So you must have a program to say that uh, all these things have been handled. And all those who people who are handling this, they should know where it is. What are the categories of hazardous waste? N number of categories of hazardous waste. You will have chemical waste. You will have pharmaceutical waste. You will have pathological waste. You will have infectious waste, 
you will have anatomical waste you will have sharps you will have genotoxic cytotoxic and radioactive waste so all different types of waste you will have and of course your pressurized container so each one where it is how much it is you must have the inventory you must have the storage you should know how to handle each area how it is handled now we may prepare an msds and keep it over there for each one when you prepare the msds what you have to think about the msds is used by the people over there you can understand english but they may not understand english so if the people who are using this msds they don't know how to read or how to understand english you have to prepare in their own local language in kerala you have to write it in the malayalam and you have to keep again when you someone asks me can i write all those msds and keep everywhere no what asadas materials are there in your icu make a list of that and prepare the msds and keep it over there what hazardous materials are there in your lab make a list prepare the hazmat material prepare the msds and put it over there not that the big one but the entire things can be with one department in my hospital it is with the housekeeping department i don't know what is in your hospital so entire list can be with one department or one person and the other fracture department can have their own things like that now going into identify the type location and quantities of all hazardous material and waste and has a complete and current inventory again current inventory monthly inventory i am not asking you for a daily inventory at least monthly inventory okay, when you have taken the inventory four months back six months back that is not accepted last month what you have taken that inventory have to be there and of course there have to be protective equipment for those people who handle proper labeling very very important proper labeling of hazardous material i don't know recently not only over here even when we go for assessment even in my own hospital md water bottle that water bottle label may be there or may not be there and people put various hazardous material and keep some various areas and person think that it is a water and they can take and drink it but it may be a hypochlorite solution it can be something else i am not joking or i am not exaggerating this is what happened in many hospital even in my own hospital my hospital is not an exception so everything i don't mind you keep it in the water bottle so what you have to do remove the label of the water bottle and put the label of the content what you are put in that bottle and then keep it over there they are not telling that okay you should have a specific label or a specific bottle over there that you can do and reporting uh, implement documentation requirement including any permit license or certain things we require license like uh, which has other material we require license spirit we require license reporting and investigation mechanism for spill exposure and other incidents information now what happen you must have up to date information available with you regarding the safe handling spill handling and procedure for managing exposure up to date not the old one every day something might have changed so that up to date same you also should have the licenses as it is required by the law now the third thing so we have finished environmental safety and then we have finished what hazardous material and in that one of the thing is that disaster preparedness identified the major internal and external disasters such as community emergency and nature or other disaster that pose significant risk in your area what disaster can occur in this perindal manna in the perindal manna as well as the neighboring district what disaster can occur you have to list and then you have to identify the probable impact if that disaster occur what will be the impact for you then what is your role something happen is it your role to act on that or nothing related to you so that you need not act determine the communication strategies for the event some train accident occur how the communication will be passed on from one place to another from your place to that area or that place to your place and of course managing the resources during the event now different types of uses resources when i talk about resources man money material anything and machinery everything how you are going to manage during the time of disaster imagine 100 or 200 patient is being brought to your organization due to a railway accident 
you cannot produce extra resources at that particular time you cannot produce extra staff you cannot produce extra consumables you cannot produce extra medications you have to manage with the resources what is available with you at that particular time and then you have to use certain times we may have to borrow from the neighboring hospitals or borrow from other medical shop or something we may have to do in certain time otherwise you have to manage by so you have to see that how you are going to manage your resources in the disaster now when a disaster occur how you are managing your clinical activity when 100 patients have been brought to your casualty area you have already 10 patient in your emergency department how you are going to manage them and this disaster patient who have been brought to your organization also require medical care how you are going to manage they not only require medical legal aspect they require medical care so how you are going to manage do you have sufficient clinicians nurses and other support staff in order to how you are going to pull out these people from the working area are you going to stop your ot are you going to stop your op opds are you going to stop your ip and then turning all people towards the emergency department in order to manage the disaster maybe for that one particular one hour or two hour period all you may have to you have to identify and assigning staff roles when disaster comes there may be cardiologists there may be gastroenterologists you require doctors there may be cardiologists there may be gastroenterologists obgyn pediatrician you have all different types of doctors but you don't want them to be in the emergency department as a cardiologist you want them as an ordinary doctor who will take care of the basic thing of the patient yes or no so that is a role when a cardiologist come over there or a cardiothoracic surgeon come he'll say oh i am a cardiothoracic surgeon i look into that no we don't want him we want him to see the basic management or basic requirement of a particular patient's basic care what he can do we don't want a neurosurgeon or anything over there then conclusion and debriefing at the same time at the end of any disaster you must have a conclusion meeting as well as a debriefing by this debriefing some lacunas occur so that that will not be repeated in the next time or this debriefing become an education or a training for the people so that next time when they participate they'll be more thing. and of course there is a follow-up action coming into fire safety fire risk assessment in the following this is very clear for the jci even when nabh also is going to be that strict in the next edition that pressure relationship in ot in ot there are various pressure relationship negative pressure positive pressure medium pressure high pressure that relationship have to be there and there should not be any leakage from a high pressure area to a low pressure area when your operation theater door is closed no pressure from the inside ot should come outside or no pressure from outside should go inside your door cannot be dangling here and there fire separators now you i just would like to say that when jci people come for assessment you know we have the false ceiling they will put a ladder and they'll climb they'll remove the, your false ceiling and they'll see above the false ceiling how does it whether there is any chances of smoke passing from this area to that area it means that is a fire separation sir any fire occur in this room it should contain in this room it should not go to the neighbor room or other room so fire separation same like smoke separation sir smoke occur it should contain in this particular room it should not go outside yesterday there was a smoke in one of the i mean a small fire in one of the hospital but the smoke went to other area so the other area people suffered because they could not see anything smoke of other area so that should not happen if you are going to be for a jci now nabh also going to come with that in the sixth edition that smoke have to be kept within that area it should not go outside hazardous areas like soil dillon room trash collection room oxygen storage this area is many main concerned area where fire can erupt fire exit all your fire exit should be functioning kitchen grease producing cooking services should be looked into laundry and your trash suit emergency power system and equipment and medical gas and vacuum system all these area you have to specially look into for the fire possibility because this area your fire can occur you have to establish and implement a program for the prevention early detection suppression abatement and safe exit from the facility in response to fire and non fire emergency early detection of fire and smoke also should be there and abatement of fire and containment of smoke have to happen all staff participate in at least one fire and smoke safety program test per year again 
how much people of in our organization participate in the mock drill you tell me b when an abh assessor comes we might have done one mock drill of fire some video you have taken and those pictures of the video we will show them you tell me how many people in my hospital i have 3000 employees how 3000 employees all 3 jci want all 3000 employee have to undergo one fire drill in a year not 10 people not the 20 people not 30 people or 100 people 500 people entire staff must undergo at least one fire drill in a year and this will come naturally in next jci uh, sorry nabh also because when we go when we do fire drill very few people attend the fire drill you tell me what percentage even my own hospital though i am so strict in my own hospital if i look into maybe some 50 60 percentage of people might have attended fire drill there may be 40% people who have not attended a fire drill every person have to attend the fire drill that's a requirement and again staff can demonstrate how to bring patient to safety fire detection and abatement equipment and systems are inspected tested maintained according to the manufacturer's recommendation inspection testing and maintenance of equipment and systems are documented not only really you have done but it has to be documented and some people document it without doing that also is not proper you have to do it and then document then of course you should have a fire valid license fire proof material for construction have fire exit in all the building smoke detectors and water sprinklers on the roof of all the floor fire extinguishers and fire alarms in all area fire hydrants in all building training in fire management fire mock drill at regular interval conducting ongoing assessment of risk to enhance protection of property and occupant from fire and smoke this is all simple what you are doing that's why i am not elaborating now our third safety is your medication safety when you think about medication safety people think patient safety means only medication safety so when we think about the medication safety from the purchasing till the end part every phase how your medication will be safe or are, how you are going to keep the, or en- ensure the safety of your medication storing you have purchased and you brought it and you have store at different areas where all you have the bulk store you have the departmental store you have a small store in your wards you have your crash cart in each of your area each area how you are going to store storing your medication at every area should focus on manufacturer's recommendation if the manufacturers have said that it has to be kept below 25 degree it has to be kept below 25 degree whether it is in the icu floor or any area or in your general store it has to be kept in that temperature if the manufacturer have said that it should be away from light it has to be away from light not only in your main store in every area wherever you store if you are having a storing pattern in your organization maybe on alphabetically or on different use of things like narcotic separate um, um, antipyretic separate anti almendic separate how you are going to keep that way you have to keep or some people maybe the company wise you may be storing that okay you can use that but whatever storing pattern you are using in one of your area should follow in all other area so this is regarding the storing and of course the storing area should not be easily accessible by everyone only restricted people can have entry to that particular store area and the store area can be near your office or near or where your eye can reach that will be there there also can be a uh, the, your con- entry control system also can be there for your store area so an inventory of that storing area have to be regularly taken when you take your inventory you have to see the abc ved and all those analysis you may have to see now prescribing prescribing medication wrong medication is one of the major concern in every organization we doctors are knowing everything but the latest update and the latest combination of the drugs are not aware so what has happened when we prescribe many times we prescribe multiple drugs and more or high dose or low dose is being prescribed so what is the qualities or what should be the requirement of a prescription all those requirement of that prescription have to be followed like your patient's name your uhid age of the patient the drug name the do- the drug name when you write it has been generic also and the dose the route and total how much number of the things has to be purchased all those things have to be there and at the end the signature 
SNDT what I say, sign, name, date, time of your doctor who prescribed the medication have to be there. So this is what, and again a prescription audit also have to be done regularly. How much prescription audit, how much more you can do that much. If I say that if you have sufficient people to do the 100% prescription audit, you are lucky that you can have 100%. Prescription audit, you may ask me OP or IP, no, it is both OP as well as IP. Audit have to be done. Now I know one or two hospitals in the country where 100% prescription audits are done OP as well as in the IP. Because the 100% prescription audits are done 100%, what has happened? Medication error in that hospital is very, very less. You cannot avoid 100%, but very, very less. But whereas in our hospital, when you look into, because in my place, maybe some 60% audit I may be doing. In some hospital, they may do only 5% or 10% of auditing. So depend upon that. So how much you can do? So audit also how to be done. And after the audit, it is not the audit is being done, you kept under the key. You have to inform the concerned doctor that this is the, what is the finding of my audit. Now the person, the clinical pharmacologist who did the audit, they may not be in a position to go and talk to a senior consultant. In that case, your senior people, you should involve. You should take it to your hand and you should involve and you should talk to them. In my hospital, I take it into my hand. If there is something where they cannot handle, I take it and I call my doctor, I go to my doctor and I talk to them. That this is what the thing is happening and where changes we may have to bring over there. Initially, you may not find any changes, but gradually you can 100% see some changes will be there. Then transcribing. After the prescription, somebody transcribe the drug, like doctor write in one area and for intending purpose, the nurse will transcribe. Or in some hospital, I found a clinical pharmacist will transcribe. So transcribing from one area to another, what can happen? Again, there can be mistake can happen. So now what has happened, NABH new requirement is that doctor only will write in such an area where no further transcription is required. Only doctor will write from that automatically it will go to the, if you have an EMR system, automatically that will go to the pharmacy and the pharmacy can dispense those medications. So that is another thing. Now and again NABH now what they brought recently in the fifth edition, Doctor have to write the prescription in the medication card. What cardex, what we say, they have to write. Not in the progress note, not in the um, any other notes where they, uh, where they write or where the transfer note or referral note, any area they write. No, they cannot. It is very clearly mentioned in our NABA standard that any prescription which is written other than the cardex cannot be administered. How many of you have seen that in the, in the standard? Raise your hands. How many of you have seen? Nobody have seen in the standard? Eh? Check the MOM standard and see that. What is there? If any medicine is written in the progress sheet, if any medicine is written in the transfer sheet, if any medicine is written in the referral sheet or any other area, it cannot be administered by the nurses. It has to be written in the cardex or medical medicine order sheet by the doctor. You got it? So, and then you cannot blame the nurse that nurse have not given. You cannot blame. Even though you have referred a patient to someone else and that referring doctor have given some medicine, that referring doctor have written in the referral sheet, it is you who is the primary doctor or your DNB who is the primary people. They have to take it and write it in the sheet. And at the end, every day, the doctor have to do the sign. Now dispensing, when this medicine, <coughs> when this medication order, when they go to the pharmacy, the dispensing of medication is there. Now dispensing, you may have to check two important things for safety aspect. Every high risk medication has to be double checked by the people. Any high risk medication have to be double checked. One person who is taking it out, as well as one person who will be dispensing and two different people have to double check the dispensing. Now I will tell you in my hospital not only <coughs> not only the high risk, every medicine is being double check. What has happened? Your dispensing error can be reduced. Administration. Again, when it comes to the, there are different rules of administration, different rights of administration. All those administration rights have to be followed by the nurses. And who can administer? The nurses, the doctors only can administer. No technician, even though in the operation theater, no technician can administer the medication. Only a doctor as well as a nurse can administer. 
Now while administering for the safety purpose, again you may have to uh, uh, think two important things. One thing, the doctor have written crocin 500 mg two times a day. Crocin 500 mg two times a day. When you indent crocin 500 mg for two times a day, you got paracetamol 250 mg. There was no crocin 500 mg. You got, what you got? Paracetamol 250 mg. So you have administered, what was the order? Crocin 500 mg two times a day. What do you have administered? Paracetamol 250 mg. How many tablets? Two tablets because it was only 250 mg. So two tablets you have given, two tablets two times a day. And next thing when you document, you are not going to write because doctor have ordered crocin. You have given paracetamol. You are going to document it as paracetamol, not as crocin. Is it clear? So that is very important. So administration and documentation. Now anyone who administer, they have to document. Never document before administering. Document before after administration only you have to document. So what was happened? You might have documented it before administration. Then suddenly some emergency occur, you forget to administer and that medicine is not administered. Now monitoring. Every patient after medication administration have to be monitored. Specifically when it high risk medication, you have to monitor very closely. And specifically when chemotherapy is there, blood transfusion, this particular area you may have to monitor more frequently. Reconciliation is very important. Reconciliation of medication means what all medications are there which the patient is taking at this particular time. I am a diabetic patient. I have gone to the hospital for a surgery. Doctor is not bothered about my diabetic. He is only, he or she is bothered only about my, di and my surgery. But I am taking my diabetic drugs. You as a doctor, you should know that I am a diabetic patient. I am taking this, this drugs for diabetic. Along with that, you will advise some antibiotic and other things also along with that for my surgical things. All those things have to be written down and that is known as reconciliation. In JCI, little elaborate reconciliation they say. What is this elaborate what they say? They say that once in a month, the primary doctor, their doctors are not like doctors are always in our hospital. Doctors are, their primary private personal doctors are there in the clinic. They first go to the clinic, sometimes only they come to the hospital. So once in a month, the patient will go to this primary doctor, his clinic doctor, and the clinic, he take all his medications, what he has taken for surgery, what he has taken for epilepsy, what he has taken for diabetes, everything he will take. He check all those medications and he prepare a final medication list. And that is the duty of that primary. Here, we don't have. But at least our nurses and doctors at every point, at the admission point, at the transfer point, and at the discharge point, every point we have to do the reconciliation of the medication. Then comes to the preparation of formulary, updating the formulary, decision to add or remove medication from the list during your uh, PND committee meeting. When medications are newly added to the list, there is a process of mechanism to monitor how the drug is used, how you add. When new drugs is being added, how you are doing, you must have. Implants and processes also should be added as or considered as the medication. Now, few medication concerns are illegible writing, wrong medicine, wrong dose, wrong patient, drip set and air bubbles, overhydration, speed of the drip, identification of each patient with similar patient names, proper handling, handing taking over during change of shape, look-alike and sound-alike drugs, renal dosing not followed many times, bleeding due to excess dose have been seen in many times, improper monitoring of INR. So these are few concerned we see across the hospital. This you may also see, so you may have to consider while medication safety when you looked into. Going into surgical safety, consent of the patient relative in writing, proper identification of the patient name and check through the wristband, proper identification mark to be operated, operated mark, site to be marked properly, and then pre-anesthesia checkup, ensure no foreign body left inside, safety measures from what to OT, 
coming back, every stage that safety we may have to look into, prevention of surgical wound infection, use of surgical safety performa in all operations, you may have to check it. Anesthesia, this is very important. There are three anesthesia mechanisms where safety ensured this PIS TIS. This means diameter index safety system. PIS means pin index safety system. TIS means touch index safety system. All three are self-explanatory. Diameter, the you when you touch by by chance I am going to attach the tubing over here. When I touch the knob, I can make out that this is oxygen and this is nitrous oxide. Okay? That is what diameter. With the diameter, I can make out. Pin, that pin when I touch, the nitrous oxide can be felt differently as well as the anesthesia gas can be felt differently. This means touch index safety system. All three systems have to be there in your anesthesia machine. It is already there. Your anesthetist may be following, but you also should know that these anesthesia safe systems are there. Here oxygen is considered as the master-slave mechanism, what we call it. Oxygen is considered as the master and the nitrous oxide is considered as the slave. Now protection of patient from anesthetic gas mishap, n number of gas mishap can occur and then you made application of standard by National Standard Association, careful evaluation of anesthesia equipment prior to purchase or installation, routine service of equipment, pre-anesthesia testing of the equipment, an understanding of the principles of functioning of the equipment along with the effective collaboration, this all should happen in order to see the safety. And then color coding of the cylinder, like wind index system, which I have told you, and equipment check carried out before anesthesia administration. Now, oxygen analyzer in the anesthesia circuit is a mandatory, and apparatus malfunction considered in the differential diagnosis of anesthetic mishap. Somebody is talking, if you have some doubt, you can ask me. Don't talk among yourself. So the radiation safety, safety measures in radiology and radiotherapy department, compliance with applicable standard, law and regulation, AERB licenses, compliance with the facility management, that is your size of your area, all site plan would be there, and con proper infection control program, availability of safety and protective devices, orientation of all radiology and diagnostic imaging staff about the safety of radiology, in-service education for new procedure and newly acquired or recognized hazardous material should be there. Comprehensive radiation safety program is there, NABH and JCA both required this. The radiation safety program includes dosing in imaging department, protocol that identify the maximum dose of radiation for each type of study, that is ALARA, you might have heard. Radiation safety risk are identified and ongoing education and training is given to the staff. Now, laboratory compliance with the standard addressing facility management infection control, availability of safety devices, orientation of all staff, in-service education for new procedure, same type like our radiology, and identified safety risks are addressed, care in handling acid, reagent, inflammable substances, all need to be taken care. Exposure to aerosol and droplet are controlled, especially while mixing, sonicating, centrifuging, and flaming inoculating loops this time there can be spread and that can be controlled laboratory coat gown or uniform are worn to protect street cloth biosafety cabinets are used when required protocol to handle laboratory exposure to infectious agents accident cut needle stick injury accidental ingestion contact of potentially infectious agents with mucous membrane should be handled and return procedure defining the safe collection transport and handling of all specimen and very important prohibiting anyone in lab technical area from eating drinking smoking applying cosmetics manipulating contact lenses and mouth pipetting i have seen some of these things are happening in some of the laboratory that's why it may not be happening in many laboratory but some of these things are happening in some of the laboratory but it is not permitted as per JCI as well as as per NABS standard. And if they, when they come, if they see that uh, your makeup set is kept over there, and then there you have been caught. Or your other things are there, you have been caught and an NC will be raised. Now sanitation, infection control and biomedical waste, proper segregation is all of you are aware, I need not go into detail. Sanitation and hygiene, 
different part of hospital to avoid infection, practice of sterile technique, safety in use of incinerator, autoclave, shredder, needle destroyer, everything, formation of hospital infection control committee, investigation of all hospital infection, use of proper antibiotic in right doses in right time, you must have an antibiotic policy in your organization, and reorientation of resident doctors and nursing staff whenever a new things have been added so reorientation and not only infection control reorientation have to be given to every staff once in a year that is mandatory now then you know our four different types of infection like cot clapsi uti as well as ssi you must have all bundles should be there and you have to use the bundle meticulously so that this can be prevented standard precautions isolation precautions safe injection practices antibiotic policy reuse policy surveillance activity and icra i have shown you earlier that pcra but here infection control risk analysis and earlier it was pre construction risk analysis were there so both have to be followed blood safety proper grouping and cross matching proper labeling control of mismatch reaction standard operating procedure screening for hiv hepatitis venereal disease malaria inform adverse reaction to blood bank electrical safety safety fuses with each equipment no loose wires or connection properly plugged and fixed if short circuit call electrician and get it rectified electricity backup battery generator should be there do's and don'ts of electrical management and use of ups whenever it is required installation whenever you install a new equipment inventory of all the medical equipment need to be taken regular inspection of that equipment have to be done by the biomedical equip biomedical engineer Preven you must have a preventive as well as a maintenance uh, uh, action plan proper earthing to avoid shock regular maintenance and repair have to be there training of nurses and technical staff specifically when a new device is been used or new update your devices there also you may have to give, give or some new technology is being used then you may have to train both the nurses as well as your technical staff and preventing inadvertent harm to patient due to inappropriate engineering principles avoidable clinical risk very very important in the clinical area by doctors and nurses blood patient mismatch can occur many time so you have to see that this is totally avoid wrong patient wrong blood wrong communication to patient and bystanders doctors give wrong communication i have n number of experience in my own hospital and hospital where i worked earlier patient two patient have been taken in the i don't have time but just till I'll, i just wanted to emphasize one or two uh, two patients have been taken in the operation theater two children have been taken and one for a de uh, wound debridement and one for a colostomy and the doctor finished the colostomy and came out and called the relative both were selina the patient name was selina both so selina's relative is called and the other selina's relatives went inside doctor started explaining all about what colostomy first stage second stage third stage relatives were wondering what this doctor is telling they have brought the patient fully for an lnd and how this will be done and then they ask the doctor for, for what you are talking about whom you are are you not the relative of selina yes we are the relative of selina they said we have brought the, our patient for just a wound debridement and you are explaining about then he found oh this is not the selina's relative because that selina's relative is gone for a cup of tea thinking that the surgery will take, take some time so why should i wait outside so communication wrong communication to wrong patient now many time it happen you are passing through the veranda some of the patient relative come and ask about doctor how is my patient you think that relative is belonging to some other patient you started explaining about is it happen yes or no it regularly happen because you cannot recognize every relatives and sometimes when they say the name also there may be two patient with the same name and sometimes the two patient will have same problem also but you cannot explain so that wrong communication critical result not communicate to the doctors on time and doctor have not communicated the same to the residents or nurses in the appropriate time infection from one patient to another patient from patient to bystander bystander to patient doctor to patient patient to doctor all this infection can occur and many patient with suicidal tendencies now again dr sugandhi what when she was talking it is your duty to identify whether your people are having some suicidal tendency in that case we should not keep that patient alone there have to be one person always with them and moreover 
<coughs> if you are keeping them in one particular room, see that that room have complete system where there is no chance this person can do the suicide. Self-harm. Many patients can do self-harm. So you identify and then you may have to see that somebody is there with the patient. Restless patient may run out of the ICU and wards many times. It happens, no? Maybe some of the drugs reaction, they run out. So how you are going to handle? That also leading into unsafe things. So that all you must have provision. These are clinical and doctors. Now finally, you have few tips for your improving patient safety. These are final thing. Constitution of Patient and Hospital Safety Committee. Do you have this committee? Yeah. It should not be for the namesake. It should be for the action thing. Appointment of Patient Safety and Clinical Safety Officer. Do you have that? Yeah. Yes. Develop clear policies and protocols. Discuss regularly patient safety initiative within the hospital staff. <coughs> Monthly facility rounds. Regular risk assessment. Regular risk assessment. Monthly risk assessment. Initiate risk mitigation activity. Once you have seen some risk mitigation activity, you have to plan so that uh, the risk will not lead into a disaster. Orientation, reorientation hospital staff on patient safety. You may think, once I have oriented, so my responsibility is over. No. Orientation and reorientation. Encourage transparency in the regular death review. When you review a death, transparency. It might have happened in your case. It may be your patient. No hide and seek. If you have hide and seek, what can happen? It is an internal review. It is not an external review. If any hide and seek you do, you will not do. Second thing, you will not do the correction. Each department divides their own patient safety protocol. And non-punitive incident reporting. If anybody report an incident, don't give any punishment. Rather, you appreciate them. So that is non-punitive. If you appreciate them, more and more incident will come. If you do not appreciate them, more and more hiding will be there. No incident will come forward. Investigate each accident, whether it is small. A patient had a fall, nothing happened. There was a near miss, nothing happened. But investigate. Why to investigate so that that should not be repeated? This time it is a no harm or this time it is a near miss. Next time when it happened, it can be a major mishap. So that's why investigate an incident reported and take remedial admission. Review, monitor and evaluate safety procedure regularly. And finally, you implement IPSG. I am not going to talk about IPSG, though I brought the slide of IPSG, just one slide. But Dr. Joseph is going to talk and elaborate on IPSG, so I am not covering IPSG. So this is all in short with that one hour why I could cover based on the NABA standard as well as the JCA standard how you can ensure your patient safety. And if you do all these things and what Dr. Joseph is going to tell you, IPSG, if you do this and that, what will happen? That there won't be any lawyer, there won't be any case against you, there won't be any lawsuit against you. What doctor? Um, What's her name? I forgot. But she has said. You got it, no? You want that or you want this? It's in your hand. You decide. Okay? Thank you. Any doubt? Anything? Any questions? Anyone? Any question? No questions? No question means you didn't understand anything. Is it or you understood everything? What is correct? Understood everything. Okay. Thank you. Madam, I have one question. From your vast experience, which is the most challenging area where patient safety is compromised? From Because you were mentioning about lots of areas where it can be a challenge to ensure the patient safety. So, which is the one area if I ask to mention? So, which is the one area you will tell that it is most challenged? See, environment is one of the areas. Environment, area because the, we may probably neglect those areas. Those areas, that is because what. we don't give more priority to that area. Yeah, but now so lots of ESG governance metrics are coming, coming. so it that may will be. be that yeah. also will be covered. Thank you. Thank you.